future. Get that off? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, everything seems to be working on YouTube, so that's good. That works. So I should be good. All right, excellent. Yeah. Oh, I can do that too. Let's try. Yes, Yeah, I think you want to split in. So I can take videos. We can start now. Today is our big pleasure to have Dr. Hillen from the University of Cambridge from the Institute of Complex System. He will talk about dynamical factors and anomalous magnetic noise in the spinal system. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, yes, I'm Jonathan. Uh, it's not actually Dr. Hallen yet, uh, but you know, hopefully within a year or so I will get there. Um, so, yes. Uh, this will be a talk focusing on spin ice, classical spin ice in particular. Um, so I'll try to introduce that properly. I uh, assume some of you know a lot about it, not everyone. Um, so, you know, it's a small group. Do feel free to ask questions while I'm talking, um, online as well as in the room. And if we can get some discussion going, that's just nice. Um, or, yeah, and if you're on YouTube, then you can't do that, but my email is on here. So um, do feel free to drop me an email if you have any questions after the talk. Um, all right. So yes, dynamical fractal and anomalous magnetic noise in spin ice. It's a project I've been working on in particular with my um, PhD supervisors. So that's Claudio Castanovo and Roderick Mössner. Uh, but then also we have on the experimental side of things, uh, Santiago Corriguera and Alan Tennant uh, who have very generously given us some of their data to uh, include in this. So, all right. Um, so we'll start by introducing spin ice and the uh, famous emergence making monopoles that are the cause of particle excitations in the system. We'll then look at the conventional way of modeling spin ice dynamics that we have called the standard model, uh, mainly so we get to go beyond the standard model later. Don't shoot me for that. Um, but yeah, so we'll look at the standard model of spin ice dynamics. We will discuss the puzzling experimental results on dysprosium titanate, which is one of the conventional classical spin ice materials. We'll then go on to introduce a new type of dynamics that I will try to motivate, find that this actually resolves to puzzles and that it does this because it introduces dynamical fractals in spin ice. All right, so classical spin ice. The idea is, is quite old and was originally introduced by Phil Anderson in a sense. So what you do is you take icing spins and you place them on a particle lattice. So icing spins, all of these blue points here on the corners of this tetrahedra. And you then constrain these icing spins to point either directly into or directly out of tetrahedron. Then you introduce ferromagnetic interactions between spins 
And if you do this, you can convince yourself that the lowest energy state for each tetrahedron is one that has two spins pointing in and two spins pointing out. Now, once you tile the entire system with these tetrahedra, you find a frustrated system, of course, because you have this, these different uh, uh, competing interactions, uh, but it's highly generated. And importantly, it has a zero temperature, non-zero entropy that can be estimated. And that has also been shown to be consistent with experiments. And you end up with these two in two out ground states that we call the I states. And the link to ice here is that in one phase of H2O ice, you have a similar structure where each oxygen has two tightly bound and two weakly bound hydrogens. And you end up with the model you can actually map directly onto this with the same entropy at zero temperature. All right, so the actual material we look at is the prosium titanate, which was uh, one of the two early materials that seem to actually satisfy this model that are well described by the spin ice model. Now, of course, we don't have perfect icing spins here. What we have instead of very large magnetic moments are dysprosium ions that then form the particle lattice. And these are in an icing-like single ion state at low temperatures because simply the plus minus 15 over 2 states are so much lower in energy compared to the excited states. So if you're at one Kelvin, you simply won't see any of these excited states. Um, you have long ranged dipolar interactions between the spins, but these are ferromagnetic as we want them to be. And this does follow the ice rules. So the ground states of the system are these two in two out states. And the reason why these long range interactions don't ruin this is due to screening effects. So effectively, we can actually model this very well with a nearest neighbor model. And the difference you'll find is really uh, mainly quantitative. Uh, yeah, and if you want to learn more about that, you should have a look in this uh, first paper here, which I think is called uh, Why Spin Ice Follows the Ice Rules. It's worth having a look. Um, but what's going to be most important for this talk are the excitations. So that when we break this two into out rule, we end up with something like here. We have a three out, one in tetrahedron. And this is a magnetic monopole. So it's a magnetic monopole in the sense that it's a source in this case, but this is the positive one of magnetic field, the spins point out of it. But also in the sense that if you have many of these excitations, you can actually map these long range dipolar interactions into a monopole monopole Coulomb like one over R law. So you'll have a Coulomb um, attraction or repulsion between magnetic monopoles, depending on the charge, um, which actually then um, describes the low temperature physics of this system uh, perfectly. And importantly, these monopoles live on the diamond lattice. All right, so to get an idea for how this looks, if we start the ground state configuration, pick one of the spins, we flip it, we flip this one here, we end up creating a pair of these excitations. So here we have three out, here we have three in, so we have a positive and a negative monopole. And then we can pick one of these three in spins, flip that and move this blue negative one out of the system. Similarly, we can move the red one to some other side by flipping spins. So in this sense, we can move the monopoles around and of course we can reverse all of this to see how two monopoles could come together and like. And what's very important for what I'll show you later is that monopole movement maps onto my excitation changes, right? Every time a monopole moves or when a pair is created slash annihilated, what you have is a spin flipping that changes the magnetization state. So we can actually at low temperature understand the magnetization of the system just in terms of the monopoles moving. So the evolution of magnetization is the same as the evolution of the monopole's position. Um, the monopoles cost some energy to create, of course, the excitation. So they cost something like four Kelvin to create, which means that if we're at low temperatures, the density will decay with this exponential law and will end up with very low densities down around one Kelvin, which is where we'll focus here. Um, monopole movements do cost some energy due to these long range laws, 
but uh, that's much smaller. So multiple motion will dominate the dynamics at low temperatures. So that's going to be very important. And we're focusing in this sub 2 Kelvin regime throughout this talk. All right. So that brings us on to the dynamics. So the conventional way of studying the dynamics of spin ice is quite unique. And it comes from these two papers, especially the second one. And the idea here is that if we're below approximately 10 Kelvin, we actually can, uh, as I said before, ignore any excited states in the dispersion ions. And we only consider these plus minus J uh, ground state signals, a uh, doublet. And the way that you can actually move them between these two is through quantum tunnel. So there is some overlap between these two states due to a transverse magnetic field across each spin. Now, what is done in the standard way of modeling it is to say that the transverse field across each spin is an average the same in this disordered frustrated system, which means that we should have a constant flip attempt rate due to this tunneling. And this means that we can actually map Monte Carlo time, classical Monte Carlo time, directly onto real physical time. These are proportional to each other. Um, so that's something that you can't usually do, right? In Monte Carlo, normally the time you have is completely right physical properties. But if you do single spin flip updates on spin ice with the Metropolis algorithm, that should, in this low temperature regime, be proportional to real physical time. And importantly, then also, uh, in terms of the monopoles, our ice rules will give us block directions. So if you look at the monopole and ask how that could move, it could move through any of these three majority spins, the out spins, not through the crossed one. And this means that essentially the monopoles will form a random walk on the diamond lattice, but with one block direction at each side. Now, if we try to run simulations with this and compare it to experimental data, we'll get to what I call the puzzles. So the first one of these is an old one. This has been established for almost 20 years now, which is that the relaxation time in classical spin ice, so here I show this frozen titanate, also applies to other ones. It diverges much faster than what you would expect from something like the standard model with any realistic Hamiltonian that you use and which you have optimized based on things like neutral scattering and specific heat measurements. Now, people try to explain this over and over again, and always you've had to invoke some extrinsic contribution, something like disorder, boundary effects, et cetera. But at this point, we have data on extremely clean and quite large single crystals. So these extrinsic contributions is not a very satisfactory explanation. Uh, and we think something else is necessary. Um, so here I'm showing experimental results from this paper, by the way, which was published earlier this year. Um, the other more recent puzzle is the anomalous magnetic noise. So what the experimentalists have done is they've taken a single crystal of this frozen titanate, they placed a squid on it, a susceptometer essentially, that you measure magnetic flux with, and you can measure how the magnetization um, fluctuates. And then you plot this in frequency space, and what you'll find is that it decays approximately as omega to the power minus 1.5 at low temperature. And we call this anomalous because essentially noise will normally in any type of conventional magnet give you a decay that goes as one or omega squared at large frequencies. And that's also what the standard model does. This we call Lorentzian uh, noises, gives us a Lorentzian light gem. So clearly something's up here. And we looked at this for a long time. I spent most of my PhD, it feels like at this point, trying to understand where this comes from. And for a long time, we were thinking that actually the, um, the solution would be in the energetics. There's something in the Hamiltonian that's missing, some contribution. Um, but it turns out that really there's no way to deform the Hamiltonian, change the Hamiltonian we're using to give us this type of behavior without completely ruining the consistency with the static measurements. So the natural way of, um, well, the natural step to take them was to move and look at what we can do about the dynamics. And then we go to what we call them, the BSM model. So the key thing here is the realization, which was outlined in this paper, that for spins that are neighboring a monopole, there are actually 
some of them, approximately one third, that will have a transverse field that is much lower, smaller. So if you have this transverse field from the nearest neighbors canceling, as you can probably convince yourself is the case here on the right, you will end up with a much smaller tunneling element and the rate at which these spins flip will be much smaller. You have much longer time scale for these flip attempts, which we call tau slow. Whereas in the case here on the left, the transverse field from these dominant nearest neighbors is actually not zero. And you then end up with a faster time scale for these flips. Now, um, if we do this, it does not in any way affect the equilibrium of uh, that um, or the thermodynamics. We haven't changed anything in Hamiltonian. And spins that are not neighboring monopole will always have a non zero field, transverse field across them. So these will always be fast. And what we do in practice then is that we um, look instantaneously at our system when we attempt to flip, ask if this spin should be fast or slow, use that. And then we use the fact that in the sprosium titanate, the ratio between these can be estimated just from the single ion physics to about 10 to the 4, which means that these slow spins are effectively static. They don't flip. And this, you know, if we take them to be 10 to the 4 times longer, doesn't make any difference. They are effectively fixed. What this means, of course, is that a monopole at any given time no longer has only one block direction. It can have, any, have anywhere between one and four, depending on how many of the majority spins are slow. And of course, also as the system evolves, these local transverse fields will change. And in that sense, spins can go from being slow to fast and vice versa. So looking back at the puzzles, what does this do? Well, this is what we had before, right? We have here the SM model in green using the exact same Hamiltonian, but just introducing these slow spins, we then get the VSM model here in black. And as you can see, this does actually work very well. It fits the experimental results incredibly well. There's only a single fitting parameter here, which is this fast time scale, which we estimate to be about 85 microseconds. And the Hamiltonian we use has not in any way been optimized to reproduce the dynamics. It's only um, been optimized for the um, for neutron scattering and specific heat. So as you can see, this seems to actually explain both the relaxation time and the magnetic noise. But then the question, of course, is why is this? Why does this, in the end, relatively small change, making one third of the spins neighboring the monopoles, which in the end is only going to be you know, a couple out of a thousand spins, making them slow. Why would that change things? Well, the key thing is, you know, the first word in my, uh, the first words in my title, fractals. Um, but to see this, we will need to step aside. And I just, maybe everyone here uh, is well familiar with percolation theory, but uh, just to make sure um, this is important. So if we have a percolation model, what we do is we pick a lattice of choice. Of course, in spin ice, that will actually be a diamond lattice. But just to illustrate, here we have a square lattice. Um, so we pick the lattice, we fill all the sites up, they're all there, but we don't place any bonds on it. And then we start filling up the bonds randomly, with up to some fraction of the bonds P. Now, at a critical point, TC, we will end up with one percolating cluster through a system. And this percolating cluster is just one that goes from one side of the system to the other. And of course, this is all true at thermodynamic, in the thermodynamic limit, so for infinite system. But very importantly, this percolating cluster is self-similar. So it's a fractal. And if we sit slightly above the percolation cluster, the system would behave as a fractal up to some correlation length. From small length scales, it's still going to look fractal. The same if it's slightly below it. It's going to look fractal, but at some point, the systems, they, all the clusters will be finite. So in that sense, we also reach some limit due to the correlation. So how do we link this to spin ice? Hopefully you already have realized this, but we have the ice rules and we have our slow spins. That's an average leaves two directions for monopoles to move in. We can of course map this onto the percolation model. And since spin ice is disordered, it means that we can actually uh, it means that this is actually done randomly. 
the way it is in a percolation model. So the monopoles are effectively random walkers on percolation clusters. So what we also realize that is that if you look up the percolation threshold for diamond lattice, it's 0.39. So if we sit at one half, we're just a bit above this, and we might expect to actually see uh, effects of this fractal structure up to some correlation length that we can then estimate in numerics. So what we are suggesting is that these anomalous properties come about because monopoles in spin ice move on an emergent dynamical fractal, which appears in this clean disorder-free system. So we can see this, we can map this out in numerics. If we take a monopole starting at this orange site here, and then ask which sites it can reach within n steps when it's moving with either the SM or BSM dynamics, what we will find is that it spreads very differently in two cases. In the SM case, it quite quickly becomes dense like this and has a more spherical distribution. Whereas in the BSM case, this is not at all what we see. Instead, it looks quite rapid actually. We have these 1D-like chains coming out of it that are then terminated. You can see this one here doesn't grow. Um, it's not at all a dense cluster. Um, we have a lot of these 1D-like arcs. And this really is the key thing, that monopoles do not visit nearly as many sites when we have this dynamics. There are two constraints. And that is also what gives us a slowdown in the system. That's why it doesn't equilibrate fast enough fast enough, as fast as the SM model would suggest. So to quantify this a bit, we can look at how these clusters grow. So the way we do that is we ask how many sites are accessible within n steps, and then we average that over a lot of different uh, configurations in our simulations. So what happens then? Well, in the SM case, this grows as one would expect, goes from very small n, it's a bit different, and then it just follows this entry three line. This is just, you know, typical dense growth. Um, but in the BSM case, we see something very different. So in the BSM case, it grows slowly up to some crossover scale that we estimate to be about 14, which gives us an idea for our correlation length in the system. And then it turns off and grows with this conventional entry three. And this previous slower growth here actually seems to match the prediction from percolation theory quite well. And that is that the fractal exponent should be 1.85. Um, so yeah, that seems to match pretty well. Finally, just kind of hammer this home. We can look at the actual percolation system. We can do the percolation model and the exact same calculation at the critical filling fraction. And we find these uh, cyan crosses here that match the spin ice model incredibly well, all the way up to this crossover length. So this is quite, um, in my opinion, quite convincing evidence that what we have here is actually fractal that you get from percolation. And just again, I can point out that in BSM monopoles, they reach you know, less than an order of magnitude as many uh, sites as the SM ones in 14 steps. And this is why the relaxation is so slow. Relaxation can only happen if monopoles are allowed to move through the system and flip spins and change the state. We can also use percolation theory to explain the noise. There, what you would expect for a random walker on a percolating cluster is that it should have a PSD, so noise, that goes as omega to the minus two, small frequencies, so that's times beyond this correlation time that we have. Whereas at larger frequencies, it should go as omega to the power minus 1.5. And if you remember, in the experiments, the exponent they found in the anomalous noise was 1.5. So this is very consistent. Now, what we can do in our simulations, beyond what we've already seen, you know, the measurements that match experiments, is that we can also look at the behavior of just a single monopole in the system. That's really just equivalent to cooling it down so much that monopoles are so sparse they don't really interact. And at that point, we can find that the um, behavior at low frequency in the BSM case is again matching this prediction from percolation theory. No, sorry, uh, yes, it is matching that prediction. It goes as omega to minus two, 
whereas at higher frequencies, we get this fractal exponent of one, well, 1 1.5. And in the SM case, we just have this conventional decay all the way. Whereas if we look at the percolation cluster, place a random walker on it, we'll find noise that goes with this fractal exponent at all frequencies. Um, one can also look at the, the actual diffusive behavior of the monopoles. Now, this is not something we can at this point see in experiments at all, but it is something that we can look at in our simulations. And it's perhaps, you know, the most common way one sees anomalous behavior and, you know, behavior on fractals is the fact that these quasi particles move with, uh, move subdiffusively. They move not as uh, square root of t, but rather as some smaller um, exponent in t. When you look at the mean square distance, um, root mean square distance. So up to our correlation time, which is about 10 to the 3 tau fast, we find this fractal exponent of 0.5. And then beyond that, we see this crossover again, similar to what we've seen in the other cases, to normal diffusive behavior. So we have subdiffusive monopole motion. So, um, yeah, that's really um, what I wanted to tell you. So what we have seen is that we have this bimodal distribution of transverse fields where some spins neighboring monopoles have a much smaller transverse field and therefore smaller cut tunneling element. And we can then introduce this to the dynamics and actually explain some of these puzzles that have been around in the field for a very long time and match experimental measurements incredibly well, which is a single fitting constant. Um, and perhaps most excitingly, what we find is that all of this is explained by the existence of an emergent dynamical fractal in this uniform disorder-free bulk system. So I hope, well, I hope that was interesting and uh, hopefully you have more questions for me afterwards than you had during the talk. Thank you very much. Okay, I believe we have plenty of time for questions. And are there any questions from the Zoom portal? You can raise your hand. So actually, I have probably naive questions. So here, the reason that you have it's such type of fractal structure is that uh, for the percolation issue, you just hit the uh, critical percolation PC and hence you need to set up. So is this phenomenon stable or if I add some additional interaction which can be part of language, is it possible that such kind of fractal structure would uh, run away apart from this point? Um, so the fractal structure comes about because of, I mean, there are two contributions, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, you have these mm -hmm. minority spins mm -hmm. that you can't move through mm -hmm. because doing that would create a double defect, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, now, of course, you could change that with some mm -hmm. energetic interactions, but mm -hmm. then you're no longer in spin I space. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of the, you know, of this fractal is the fact that you have these slow spins. Mm -hmm. So there, as long as you have a sadistic case mm -hmm. that the transverse field is bimodal mm -hmm. um, and that you have this ratio that one third of them mm -hmm. are slow. Mm -hmm. This is what you should expect. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, if you have long range interactions in a magnetic system, they will generally also contribute to the transverse field across mm -hmm. bits, right? Mm -hmm. So if they were strong enough, then you could definitely end up breaking this. The reason mm -hmm. why we see it in this case is the same reason why these long range dipolar forces do not break mm -hmm. the spin ice model. Mm -hmm. It is screening. Mm -hmm. um, but then of course, if you had a different geometry mm -hmm. or if you some reason broke this, you know, ability of the system to screen itself, mm -hmm. then yes, then you wouldn't expect to see this anymore. Um, then you would expect that all spins, I mean, you could either have more time scales, so you could have mm -hmm. time scales that are so similar, nothing happens, mm -hmm. uh, or they could just all be very, you know, they could just, be a continuum of different time scales because mm -hmm. they're continuum and transverse fields. All of these things could happen. Um, but it all kind of would require you to break the spin ice model. I see. And if I add additional quantum fluctuation, like I'm thinking about a quantum spin ice where the zero temperature wave function is more like a coherent sum of all in all out configurations, and there we also have charge excitation and quantum excitation. Mm -hmm. 
can we expect a similar fractal structure to some extent? Um, so we we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we have we have some indications that we would not. And the main indication for that is the fact that if you do loop updates, mm -hmm. so you know in the um, quantum spin ice model, the mm -hmm. you know second order contribution in the Hamiltonian mm -hmm. are these loop mm -hmm. closed loops. Yeah. If you include those in the simulation, you allow closed loop to actually flatterate and flip. Mm -hmm. That breaks this because what you end up doing then is you end up essentially ruining the memory in the system. Oh, I see. So even if, of course, there will still be the mm -hmm. same number of slow spins, mm -hmm. which spins are slow will change faster mm -hmm. than what the monopole um, than the memory of a monopole essentially, which I means see. that so you won't have any fractions. Again, damage such type of memory. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, also here it's easy spin, and if I begin with something like a O3 spin version of the quantum spin, uh, classical spin ice model, is that enough? Um, like the Heisenberg spin yeah, ice. Yeah, Heisenberg spin ice. I, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't mm -hmm. think so. Um, I mean, the key thing, of course, is that in Heisenberg spin ice, mm -hmm. you do not have the same point like these yeah, that see. move, mm -hmm. you know, in a discrete step in the mm -hmm. same way. Mm -hmm. So. We haven't looked at it at all, but mm -hmm. my, my feeling would be that you should not find this type of behavior. I mean, this relies very much on the fact that directions are blocked. Mm -hmm. and I don't see how you would end up with that in the, uh, the Heisenberg case. Okay. Uh, any other? I have a question, actually. Yes. I have a couple of questions. Um, so first of all, I thought this talk was really good and really palatable and easy to digest, even for somebody who doesn't have a lot of exposure. Um, but um, I was wondering, so this is a low level question. Um, for those of us less familiar, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the basics of um, the excited state that leads to the emergent, like effective magnetic monopole. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, I don't have any slides on this, but um, let's go back just a few steps. Um, so I think the first thing I should say is this paper is, is very nice. Um, and that's where they kind of, that's where they introduce these magnetic monopoles. Um, so there are a couple of things to mention here, common, <coughs> some comments. Calling them magnetic monopoles does sometimes make people angry. Um, of course, because you know they only exist in spin eyes. They only exist in discrete positions. Uh, so in that sense, you know, they are quasi particles through and through. Um, but it is the language that's used in frustrated magnetism at this point. Um, so the key thing here is that we start out with this highly degenerate state, which has these two in, two out um, configurations everywhere. And as soon as we break that, we end up with a point like defects. Now, what you will realize, I mean, what should be clear from this picture is one of the special things about frustrated magnetism in general. Quite often, these defects that are effectively like domain walls, in some sense, you can think of them a bit like domain walls in a normal IC model, right? They are free to move. There's no tension in the system. Um, and that's something that you wouldn't really find in a conventional magnet in 3D. Normally, you know, if you take like the 2D IC model as an example, right? If you introduce some defect and you want to grow it, you create, you know, a domain wall around it. But anytime you try to grow this, the energy grows, right? There's a tension trying to constrict the system again. In this case, on an, at least nearest neighbor level, there is no such energy here. If there's no difference between you know, this configuration here and the one where this has moved one step further away, all that happens when we move this monopole is that it goes from having one you know, a quantum energy here to having one there. Now, this is not completely true because you have these long range dipolar interactions, which gives you this Coulomb law um, thing. But actually, the monopoles are still free to move around. And because there are other ones in the system as well, the actual attraction won't be large enough to confine them. So, this is something that happens in other um, frustrated systems as well, especially if you have icing like degrees of freedom for spins, where you can introduce defects locally almost always in pairs, but these are then free to move around independently of each other. 
Um, in terms of other things that they do as, as monopoles, um, the most important thing is, as I said before, that they are essentially sources and sinks of magnetic flux, and they are point defects of a gauge field. As uh, so you can introduce, you can rewrite this in a core strain model where this, you know, instead of having the spins, you have some sort of spin field, gives you a gauge field, and then any monopole will be essentially uh, an, a, a, a source or sink of that gauge field. Does that kind yeah, of thanks. A bit? yeah, thanks for talking a little bit more about that. Um, so I had a related question um, that I think you're kind of hinting towards. So um, at one point you showed us the power spectral densities versus frequency, and we saw like the behavior that's more akin to like the omega to the power of minus 1.5. Yeah. And this was for the very low temperature case at less yes. than a Kelvin, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, but then we also compared that behavior in the beyond standard model to the standard model yeah. um, for when we're talking about the fractals and how the spins move from site to site. But at one point, I believe you mentioned that it costs a lot of energy to move from site to site. No, it's, it's the other way around. So, yeah, because uh, you were saying. Yeah, yeah. So it's wall. moving. Moving from site to site, I mean, it will depend on temperature and things like that, right? And, you know, if you have two monopoles next to each other, moving them apart costs more. But typically, at temperature of, like, let's say, 0.8 Kelvin, the energy you expect for a move is something like 0 0.05, mm -hmm. roughly. Okay, thanks for Whereas, you know, the cost of creating a pair is about 8 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's so it's, it's very cheap to move around. So the way that we've been talking about this in the past is to say that, Essentially, the monopoles move in a flat energy landscape. There's um, no real energetic reason for them to move in a certain direction if at these temperatures. There's no strong bias. Of course, they are attractive or repulsive, so that it will give you know, some deviations from this completely flat landscape. But really, you have defects that move you onto some energy level that is just given by the number of defects you have in the system. And then the monopoles move in that flat-ish landscape. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. All right. Any any other questions? It doesn't seem like there's anything online, but if there is, just mute yourselves and uh, chat. All right. Okay. Then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you for coming as well, for having me uh, give a talk. Thank you for giving it.